Happy Mother's Day, Mom. We, we love, you. love you. Happy Mother's Day. I just want you to know how blessed I am to have you as a mother and how very proud I am to be your daughter. Have a wonderful day, and I love you so much. Thank you for adopting me, Mom. I love you so much. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. We love you. Hi, Mom. We love you and miss you. Happy Mother's Day. Can't Happy wait to Mother's see Day. You. Happy Mother's Day memory to my mom. And happy Mother's Day birthday to our daughter, Susan, who was born the day before Mother's Day and has a birthday this year the day after. I couldn't have had a better Mother's Day present. Hi, Mom. Thank you for supporting me and taking care of me and loving me. And I love you too, Mom. Happy Mother's Day, Mom and Grandma. We love you and thank you for all that you do. Happy, Happy Mother's Day! Day. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Hope you have a great day. Love you. Bye! Hi, Mom. You're the best ever. Thank you for loving me. Hi, Mom. Happy birthday. And Merry Mother's Day. From the Brewer family. And the Dean. Happy Mother's Day. 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 Good morning and welcome to the United Methodist Church of the Dunes. I'm Pastor Lou Grattenberger and you have arrived at our online worship experience. We uh, launch these each Sunday morning uh, by 8.30 a.m., but they're available all through the week. So we hope you'll join us again and maybe even take a look at some of the older ones if you haven't joined us before in worship. We hope that you are doing well and we are praying for you. My name is Carla and I'm the Director of Communications at Church of the Dunes. There's a bulletin to go along with today's worship service. If you're watching this through the church website, just underneath this video screen is a button labeled May 10th Bulletin. Click that for the order of worship today. Also, contact information for the church and additional announcements. In there, you'll find an appeal from Family Promise and news from Supper House. There's details on how to access the Upper Room Devotion Book both online and how to request a paper copy. There's an update from the Missions and Social Concerns Commission about the very generous Lenten offering received at Church of the Dunes earlier this year. So please take a couple of minutes to check that out. As you know, the church building is currently closed and staff are working from home. This situation doesn't lend itself well to producing the monthly Dunes Digest newsletter that we've all become accustomed to. However, a Dunes Digest in brief was recently produced and was emailed out late last week. If you did not receive it, please contact us so that we can get that sent your way. For the health and safety of all, the Michigan Conference of the United Methodist Church has asked all Methodist churches across the state to refrain from in-person gatherings at this time. We don't know when we're going to get the green light to begin gathering together in person. For now, we will continue to plan online worship services. And thank you so much for making online worship from home an important part of your week. As updates are received from the Michigan Conference, we will post them on the church's website at umcdunes.org and on the church's Facebook page. And remember, the church phone number has been forwarded. So if you have questions or would like information, don't hesitate to give a call. Now let's join Pastor Lou as he leads us in the invitation to worship. Please join me in our call to worship. Praise the Lord who has shown us the wonders of his unfailing love and who for the sake of his name leads us and guides us. In you, O oh Lord, we put our trust. 
you are our God, and our lives are in your hands. Lord, let the light of your face shine upon us. Though we celebrate separately, we know we're together in your presence. Amen. boys and girls it's a special day it's Mother's Day a day that we say thank you for the people that cared for us and shared words for us that help us in our life our story today is about Stephen and Stephen's story is a very difficult one to hear and to tell but it talks about something that happened as common practice in the days of Jesus, and that was stoning people, hurting people with stones. Today I've gathered together a special collection. In fact, I didn't really gather it. It was given to me by my son Eric to share with you today. You see these beautiful rocks. There's a, a clear one, kind of crystally looking. I have a flat one that you might actually be able to stack things on and use to build. And so I wanted to use rocks to remind us about how we use uh, words in our life today. One of the things that we learn in Sunday school and also at home is that we need to use words in ways that don't hurt. And so sometimes rocks are used to hurt. Sometimes they're a symbol of how we might help and work together to build something good. And so I want you to think about words that way too. A word that comes out of your mouth can hurt somebody if it's not the right word or said in the right way. But a word that comes out of your mouth might also help by being thankful, by sharing something that would help another person, by encouraging another person. We hope that today you will remember the people that have encouraged you, especially say thank you to moms that have encouraged you throughout your life. And we ask you to say a special blessing for them today and work, share those words of encouragement with them on a regular basis. We pray with me, please? Dear God, we ask your blessing on, on our moms, but on all people who might have mothered us or cared for us or touched our life. And we ask you, God, to help us be the kind of people that share words that help rather than words that hurt. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please bow in prayer and join me in our prayer of confession. Lord of abiding love and infinite patience, be with us this day. We have come from times of stress, difficulties, as well as times of hope and joy. 
We bring to you our concerns and our fears, and you offer your healing mercies. We confess that we haven't thought a whole lot about you this week. We have let events and demands crowd you out of our thoughts and our actions. Yet when we come here to worship, we again kneel in contrition, seeking your forgiveness for our blindness and apathy. Turn our lives around, Lord. Help us look again at the many ways in which you bless and care for us. Help us to be people who will reach out to others in loving compassion. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. Even though we are a stubborn people, still God absolutely loves and forgives us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. This time we join in our uh, reflection and offering. Of course, we give each week so that we might bless the ministries of this church. We do that by mailing our checks in uh, to 717 Sheldon or simply by getting online and taking advantage of the online giving opportunities. Some of you may have an opportunity within your own bank accounts uh, to simply author an electronic gift as well. And we hope you use one of those methods to support our giving and our ministry. Uh, of course, thank you for all you've already done. Please join me in offering a prayer of dedication over our offerings. We are better together. When we join in music or mission or ministry or fellowship, we discover that God makes us better being built upon one another like living stones in the house of the Lord. We join together now as we send our tithes and offerings. We have a common faith and a common call to be in ministry together. Receive our gifts this week, O God. Out of the bounty of our hearts, we respond with faithful generosity and love. May these gifts become blessings for others in the name of your church as they have been blessing for us. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from the Psalms. Psalm 31, verses 1 through 5 and 15 through 16. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand, I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. May God bless this reading from Holy Scripture. Call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where your feet may fail. I find you in the mystery All oceans deep My faith will stand And I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise My soul
Hear this reading from the book of Acts, chapter 7, verses 55 through 60. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout, all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. Let us bow in prayer. Dear God, as we look at your scriptures and study what is there, we pray that it might give us inspiration for dealing with the day that we have ahead and the week that we have ahead, and that we might be drawn together in Christian faith and sent out to make a difference in this world through the words we hear this day. In Jesus' name, amen. I imagine as I begin today, a lake, serene and still, not a ripple anywhere in sight. I reach down and pick up a stone and throw it as far as I can. When it hits, I hear a distant splash. I watch as concentric circles ripple their way out in every direction until they reach my feet at the edge of the shore. When the followers of Jesus, in the midst of their silent grief, discovered an empty tomb, that empty tomb was like a splash. Everything changed, and the ripples of Jesus' love came to the feet of the bereaved and those powerless followers. One by one, the ripples of good news and grace splashed out in every direction from that tomb, that grave, that risen Christ. With that hope today, that someday we will hear and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, our Creator, we move out today from where we are, from that distant splash of an empty grave to a world that needs God's love today. As we dig into our story in the book of Acts, we must look at this passage in its literary context. Now, if you remember from your Bible study, Acts is kind of like the sequel to the Gospel of Luke. Sometimes we even call the Gospels, and especially in this case, Luke, the biography of Jesus. And then the book of Acts might be called the biography of the Holy Spirit. Others say that the Luke stories are the Luke stories are the stories of Jesus, and the book of Acts is the story of the church and of everyone who followed Jesus. Luke and Acts intricately woven together, both in context and theme. I invite you now to think about how all this fits together, to flip back in your Bibles to the end of the book of Luke, the, the first book. In the series, chapter 24, verses 24 through 49. Here, Jesus explains, in fact, he explains his own death, his resurrection, in the context of the laws of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Sometimes we ask those questions about why the Hebrew scriptures are included in the Bible if they are the Old Testament. But this passage in Scripture tells us in the book of Luke that he opened their mind to understand the Scriptures and then explained what he had done, that he had died, that he had risen, and that he forgave us all. He then explained what they needed to do, which seems pretty simple on the front end, but something that we sometimes still forget. He said, start preaching repentance and forgiveness of sins. And now we are told to do this in Jesus' name. We are called to be witnesses in Jerusalem. Right then, in that moment, in that, 
and that revelation of Jesus and Jesus's ministry and invitation and commission, Jesus dropped the pebble in their pool and ministry in Jesus' name began. When we arrive today at the text in Acts, we find Stephen, one of the early followers of Jesus. In fact, Stephen was part of what we would call the second gen Christian leadership. Once ministry began to expand, Stephen was commissioned along with six others to take on the work of caring for new Greek Christians and especially the widows. Because the workload had gotten so great, the apostles realized that they needed helpmates. They needed other people to step in and assist. So Stephen and his fellow six deacons became part of that ripple effect of the gospel and of the resurrection. But not too long into his work, Stephen is called in on trumped up charges of blasphemy. Maybe you'll remember that someone else, Jesus, also was brought in on trumped up charges of blasphemy. And now it's being played out in those who follow him. He is brought, I mean Stephen, is brought before the Jewish authorities, the Sanhedrin, the same group, maybe not the same people, but that same group that Jesus was asked to defend himself in front of. Now, does Stephen cower in fear? No. He launches into a Bible lesson where the listeners, the Sanhedrin and the others, become a hapless, unfortunate part of the story in the end. As he explains that the story of God began with Abraham, with the Israelite people, as they became people, from Abraham to Jacob and his sons, and then to Moses, and finally all the way to David and the Temple of Solomon. And Stephen describes these listeners, the Sanhedrin's ancestors, as people who are disobedient complainers, and who are now, like their ancestors, trying to put God in a box or a house, according to Acts 7.48. But Stephen declares to those who have jailed him, you're a stiff-necked people with uncircumcised heart and ears. You're just like them, like the people in your stories, in your scriptures, in your heritage. Stephen suggests that once again, God was on the move and they were missing the point completely. You can't keep God in a box. God always gets out. Oh, if we would quit repeating the mistakes of the past. The people's response are telling. I mean, the listeners on that day to Stephen, they were angry. They were violent. What they describe is so interesting. It says they covered their ears to avoid hearing Stephen speak. As if the truth hurt. And you'll see in the story that they pledged their allegiance to Saul by laying their coats at his feet. Now, it doesn't say they pledged allegiance. It just shows and tells the visual event that those who were there laid their, their coats at the feet of Saul. Remember, Saul is the one who would later become Paul. But the laying of coats at the feet, are the, it's an allusion to what Jesus' would-be followers had done on Palm Sunday as he made his way from the outskirts of Jerusalem into the center. They had thrown their, their coats on the ground to show their allegiance and their belief that Jesus was the leader of the future. But when Stephen turned his eyes toward heaven and said, I see God and I see Jesus standing side by side in the heavens, it was too much. Stephen, like Jesus, was in that moment executed and martyred by the crowds, stoned to death. And so that became his witness. In fact, in the Greek, witness and martyr have the same root, the same word. Even Saul, the lead prosecutor, 
or persecutor had emblazoned on his heart and psyche that day a picture that I'm sure he couldn't erase from his mind, though it may have been replicated again. This was the first event of the great persecutions that would, would befall the Christians. Saul saw in Stephen that day how Jesus would have acted had he been there that day in person. He tacitly participated by standing off to the side and watching these events and not doing anything, though he may have had the authority to change Stephen's lot. And so just a few sentences past the scripture we read today, we see articulated that the great persecution began, dispersing disciples of Jesus away from Jerusalem and into Judea and Samaria. You have to wonder about Saul. Remember, often we refer to the uh, experience of an immediate coming to faith as a Damascus Road experience. But I have to wonder that Saul, seeing what he did that day, if maybe, just maybe, a, a seed was planted in his heart that this Jesus might be more than he had imagined. And that his Damascus Road immediate experience was something more of a journey that began on that day, even though he would do things that were horrible after that, that he would never forget Stephen's face, Stephen's words of forgiveness. So these persecutions and executions, starting with Stephen, began to be, be exacted on many more people. And in fact, the, the, the persecutions rippled out, in effect. But the reality was that somehow, paradoxically, the Great Commission was fulfilled as the Christians were pushed out of Jerusalem and Judea into Samaria and eventually beyond to the ends of the earth. So I guess it's true. In everything, God works for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. While Stephen is stoned, we hear echoes of Jesus on the cross calling out to God when Stephen says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Remember, Jesus said, into thy hands I commit or commend my spirit. And so the followers of Jesus, as they are slaughtered, also commend themselves, commit themselves even more fur fiercely to God and especially to Jesus Christ. And like ripples in a pool, this witness, this martyrdom motivated others to endure and also be witnesses for Jesus because of those who had gone before them and suffered and trusted in God. Jesus' witness was not just about martyrdom, though. They went around like Jesus had done, healing, exercising evil, enduring persecution. This became their witness. So what does this mean for us? As ripples of God's love and grace in Jesus Christ make their way to our feet, to our shoreline, to our nation, to our world, to this time. Oh, I, I suppose we could cover our ears in fear and allow angry, reactive ripples to emanate from our current pain. We see evidence of that already in our world. We could cower when we see threat. We could be angry when we hear God's word, love our enemies. Or we can choose to react as Jesus would have, as Stephen did, with God's love and grace, and prove once more that the rabbit of love and forgiveness can be pulled out of the hat of threat and fear when God is involved. I say it again. The rabbit of love and forgiveness can be pulled out of the hat of threat and fear when God is involved. Don't forget that. If not magical, it is certainly mysterious. God sees hope where we don't. God sees a way when there seems to be no way. 
But then we remember we are Easter people. We must not forget the ripple effect of an empty grave, of a loving Savior, and the faithful followers of Jesus who were the early witnesses and moved from that day to ours, inviting each of us to, to pick up our pebble, our pebble of love, our pebble of forgiveness, our pebble of, our pebble of desire to be a close follower of Jesus and throw it as far as we can into the pool that this, this hurting world is so that the ripple effects of God's love and forgiveness may never end. We pray these things in the name of the living Christ, of the body of Christ that we call the church, of the Spirit of God, which infects our heart. And we pray for the ripple effects of God's love to never end. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Oh Lord God, you have brought us to this place and this day. For most of us, this place is not even leaving our own homes to experience worship today. But we do leave the place of our everydayness, of our engagement with the world, of our anxieties and our trials. And so now we ask your peace upon us that we might be thinking about the other more than ourself and always focused on you, O oh God. Remind us that real power is your power, that violence never brings justice, but that prayer and peace and action of your love brings the peace that only you can bring. And so we ask that peace to abide in our hearts, in our world, even now. As we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will you join us in our final hymn at this time? and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ go knowing that our witness matters, that as we model ourselves after the example of Christ, others will be drawn to the merciful love of God. Go in Christ's power.